There, Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to the Freedom Through Faith broadcast today. Praise God. We're so blessed you're joining us. It's a blessing every time we get together around the Word of God, and today is going to be no exception. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. We'll get started in today's Bible study. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you for all that you've done for us. We thank you most of all for Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. But Lord, we thank you and praise you for the technology you have made available to share your gospel around the world. Hallelujah. Just like the Bible says would happen in these last days. Father, we give you honor, glory, and praise for all that you accomplished through today's broadcast. We pray to be led by the Holy Spirit in our discussion of the word. And Lord, may you be honored and glorified in all that is accomplished. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. I call it laying the solid foundation of faith. We do this each and every week just to lay that solid foundation upon which we're going to build. Amen. Just repeat after me. Remember, say, this, say these words at least loud enough for your own two ears to hear your own voice say these words out loud because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Just repeat after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead and ascended up into heaven and is seated now at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he is about to return to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 Shout amen somebody somewhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Praise the Lord. All this week, I've been praying about what the, what the Lord would have me share. And I, and I was taken back to the beginning. Amen. And as I was reading about Adam and Eve's fall, why? Why did they fall? Well, they tapped into the tree God said they weren't prepared to handle yet. A tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the world we live in today is vastly different from the world of the Garden of Eden. But yet, in many ways, it's the same. In the beginning, God created a world of beauty, purpose, absolute order, Humanity was placed in this world free from sin, free from any kind of evil, with just the responsibility of caring for the garden. Adam and Eve were blessed to live in such a state of sinless innocence. Everything they needed was provided for. They walked in perfect fellowship with God. But we know the story. And how one decision changed everything. Humanity was just given one prohibition. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. God and his wisdom placed a boundary on all of creation. Uh, he placed a boundary around this tree. He didn't put a fence around it because they were to tend to it. They were to take care of it. Just don't eat from this tree. This is my tree, God said. What tree was that? The knowledge of good and evil. And it was for their own protection. But the devil, cunning, deceitful, 
We know the story. He led Eve to take the fruit soon after Adam followed. And that one decision introduced sin into paradise. Separating them from God and changing the entire course of human history. Well, folks, we're not that different from Adam and Eve. Today, right now, as I'm speaking this in the 21st century, the Internet has become our modern-day tree of knowledge. It offers us access to unlimited amounts of information, both good and bad. Just as the serpent deceived Eve, the enemy is still at work today. Amen? He entices us with the promise of knowledge that unfortunately leads many of us astray into social media. We live in what's called the information age. But just as Adam and Eve found out, all knowledge is not good for us all the time. Not all knowledge will bring us closer into a relationship with God. And one of the most destructive forms of knowledge today concerns gossip. Just as Eve was deceived into believing that the forbidden fruit would make her wise, many of us today are deceived into thinking that consuming and sharing gossip online is harmless as well. But folks, I'm here to tell you, it's not. Gossip is toxic. Gossip ruins relationships. It damages people's reputations and takes us further from God's purpose for our lives. Now, let's go back to the beginning here for a moment. When God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them everything they needed. Nothing was left undone. The garden was a paradise, abundant with food and so beautiful. Everything they could ever want was right there. There's only one thing God said. Do not eat from this tree. Take care of it, but do not eat from it. Matter of fact, Let's turn there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat from it you will surely die. Now, I don't know about you, but if God had given me an entire garden, and said, everything here is yours except that one tree over there. It belongs to me. Do not eat from it. Well, I think I'd like to steer clear of that particular tree. But that's not what happened here, is it? The serpent, the ultimate deceiver, approached Eve and just put a little tiny twist on God's words. He made the forbidden fruit seem so appealing, so desirable that Eve could no longer exist. She ate the fruit. Adam was right there with her, and she gave it to him, and he ate it too. Genesis 3, 6. You know, when I was little, as most parents would seem to have intimate knowledge of, it's hard to get your kids to eat vegetables. It's hard to get them to eat something that they just, it's just, it doesn't look appealing, it doesn't smell appealing, it doesn't taste appealing. For me, it was spinach. But about that time, here comes Popeye the Sailor Man. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the movie, I'm talking about the original cartoons, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I just dated myself right there. But my grandparents were like, look. If you eat your spinach, you can be like Popeye. Well, that did it for me. I started eating spinach. And to this day, I don't the fresh spinach is all right, you know, in a salad or something. You know, but you open up a can of spinach like Popeye used to eat, man, I'm all into that. Amen. <laughs> but what do they do? They just took a little twist on something and made me desire it. And that's what the devil did to Eve right there. Right, And that moment that they took that bite, their eyes were opened. 
Oh, they gained the knowledge. The devil did not lie. They gained the knowledge, all right. They'd be just like God and how much they're going to you know, start to understand. But that was knowledge they were never meant to have. They now knew, both of them, they knew both good and evil, whereas before they only understood the good. And that new knowledge of evil is what led to their downfall. They ended up being banished from the garden, separated from God. And now sin entered the world. We fast forward to today. We live in a time where knowledge is more accessible than ever before. With the click of one button, we can learn anything we want. We have access to information about people, places, events, and more. Television goes 24 hours a day on multiple, multiple, multiple channels. Back when I was growing up, you had three. ABC, NBC, and CBS. That was it. And about, well, no later than midnight. That's usually when they went off the air. I'd stay up. And you'd hear them play the national anthem. And then this, what they call a, a, look to me it looked like a target. And it said, we'll be back at 6 a.m. And that was it. There was nothing on from midnight to 6 a.m. Times have changed. And not for the better. All right? An article I read recently said that the volume of knowledge, the amount of knowledge, is doubling every 12 hours. Now, this article said the doubling rate of knowledge back in 1945 was every 25 years. Just think about that for a moment. And I'll use this as an example. If all knowledge could be put into a set of encyclopedias, which if... You don't know what that is, Google it. There we go back again, right? But basically, it's a book. I'll just... Every volume of the encyclopedia would be about that thick, if not thicker. And there's usually one for every letter of the alphabet, sometimes multiples, okay? The point being, if all knowledge could be printed out into a set of encyclopedias, and that's what they call the whole set. It might be 25 books there, that size, that go from A all the way through Z. All right? If you took all of the volume of knowledge today and printed them into books, the entire set needed to contain that knowledge would double in size every 12 hours. If, let's say, you could put all of these books inside a skyscraper, you know, for those of you who don't know what a skyscraper is, it's a big building in the city, okay? We used to call them skyscrapers. It looked like the top of the building was scraping the sky. But if you put all those books into a building downtown, one of the biggest buildings they, your city ever had, right? By lunchtime, you'd need two buildings. By dinner time, you'd need four. Tomorrow at lunchtime, you need eight. By dinner time tomorrow, 16. By the end of seven days, you would need an entire new city just to contain all these books that are being printed. But here's the problem, folks. Not all knowledge is good for us. Just because we can know about something doesn't mean we should know about something. There's a form of knowledge that, like the fruit in the Garden of Eden, leads to our destruction. And today, in today's society, one of the most dangerous forms of this knowledge is gossip. Gossip's nothing new. It's been around since the beginning of time as well. Matter of fact, that's what the devil used on Eve. He goes, didn't God say this? And she tried to correct him. He goes, I don't think that's right. Because if you really want to study this out, Eve, you'd find out that God's holding back on you. Really? Yeah, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But that's where it started. That was a form of gossip. 
Scripture repeatedly condemns gossip as a destructive and sinful behavior. Proverbs 16 verse 28 says, A perverse person stirs up conflict. A gossip separates close friends. Proverbs 11.13 warns us that a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. This verse makes it clear that gossip destroys relationships. It breaks trust. It causes a division. It damages our witness as followers of Christ. But in today's world, gossip has taken on a new form. No longer is gossip just something whispered about behind closed doors. No. Now it's broadcast to the world through social media, blogs, news sites. We live in a time today where gossip spreads faster than a wildfire. And it's causing even more damage than ever before. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say you're scrolling through your social media feed. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, of course. And then you see a post, we'll just say a celebrity who's been caught in some scandal. The headline grabs your attention. Before you know it, you've clicked on the article. You're, you've read every sordid detail. Then you make a comment like, wow, I can't believe this guy did that. You know, what a jerk or whatever, right? And then you share the article with your friends at that moment, you have participated in gossip. You've consumed knowledge that wasn't even meant for you. Did it affect your life in any way? Did it affect your job or your family in any way? No, but yet you've contributed now to the spread of that gossip. Well, now, Brother Bob, hold on now. You know, you're getting a little nitpicky there. I mean, it's just a celebrity. They're used to people gossiping about them. It's not like I'm gossiping about my coworker or my neighbor or something. Folks, here's the truth. Just like sin is a sin, well, gossip is a gossip. No matter who it's about, whether it's a celebrity, a politician, or someone you know personally, spreading rumors and talking about others in a negative way is sinful. And when we participate in that, whether by reading, sharing, or commenting, we're allowing the enemy to use us to spread a division and destruction. <clears throat> yes, Lord. I was going to share something. Jesus said, just hold that thought. But here's some parallels between gossips and what happened in the Garden of Eden. The parallels between what happened in the Garden of Eden and our modern-day engagement with online gossip it's striking. In Genesis, the serpent tempted Eve by making the forbidden fruit appear desirable. And he promised that she would receive knowledge. He promised her wisdom. He promised her power. He promised her she would be just like God. But the knowledge she gained wasn't the kind that brought life Instead, it brought death. It brought spiritual death, relationship death, eventually physical death. Today, the internet is full of forbidden fruit. It offers us access to all kinds of information. And much of it is very appealing. It tempts us with the promise of knowledge. But not all of that knowledge is meant for us. Gossip's one of the most dangerous kinds of knowledge. When we engage in gossip, folks, we're consuming information that's hurtful, unnecessary. Some of the time, if not most of the time, it's a lie. It's not true. Like Eve, we're deceived into thinking that this knowledge will give us some kind of power or some kind of satisfaction. Instead, it leads to broken relationships, damaged reputations, and a loss of our own peace. The serpent in the Garden of Eden was subtle. He made that fruit look very harmless, even beneficial. In some way, online gossip can seem harmless at first. It might even seem like a way to stay informed or connected. Proverbs 26 verse 20 warns us, 
Without wood, a fire goes out. Amen. And then it goes on and says, without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. Gossip fuels conflict. Gossip stirs up strife and causes unnecessary drama. Amen. It distracts us from our true purpose and pulls us away from God's plan for our lives. The internet is a modern day tree of knowledge. I mean, just think about that for a moment. In the center of our lives, at the click of a button, we have access to more information than any other generation in history. Some of that information is good to have. Some of it helps us to grow. Some of it helps us to learn more. Some of it helps us to become better equipped to live the lives God called us to do. But not all information is good. Just like in the Garden of Eden, some of the knowledge we find online is dangerous to our own existence and our own souls. Gossip, like I said, you, you can't escape from it. How, how often? <clears throat> yes, Lord. How often do you come across a story on the internet It's nothing more than gossip, cleverly disguised as news? Whether it's about a celebrity, a politician, somebody in your own community, the internet is full of articles and videos and social media posts that spread rumors and half-truths and slander. When we consume this type of content, we're no different from Adam and Eve taking a bite out of that forbidden fruit. Oh, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Praise God. I know I'm stepping all over your spiritual toes right now because there's a lot of people out there that are addicted to social media. They spend almost every waking hour checking posts, checking the social media platforms. They're reasoning, I'm just seeing what's going on. If imp oh. <clears throat> If your employer started to privately track the amount of time people are on their phones on social media and then dock their pay for that time, I'm willing to bet some people lose half their paychecks. Think about it. They just instill cameras and stuff or they monitor the, the, the internet access. And all of a sudden they come in and say, two weeks ago, we watched you on your phone. You're here eight hours a day. You spent five hours looking at your phone. We're taking away that five hours of pay. What would happen to your finances? Ouch. Yeah. I know I stepped on those toes now, didn't I? Well, praise God. Don't stick your toes out from underneath the table and Brother Bob won't have to step on them. But you know what I'm saying is true. I mean, there was a... <clears throat> I'm raising my hand. There was a time a few years back, it was about four years or so ago now, I was like that too. Because of the nature of our ministry and what I do, I'm on the computer almost every single day. And I have a lot that needs to be accomplished every single day. And I would use social media to help me get the word out, right? Then I go back and check my posts to see how many likes I had and how many comments I had and then reply to some comments. Then I check out others that I follow on social media and interact with their stuff too. One day, I, I had... I had a lot to do. So I said, okay, let me get my social media stuff out of the way first. And I started through this process and all that. I looked up. I had been on that social media platform. I'm not going to mention faith, Facebook's name. But I was on that social media platform for four hours. And realized I had accomplished zero work that day. Well, that day, I literally stopped. Spending more than five minutes a day, five minutes a day on social media. Yeah, that's it. Well, Brother Bob, you know, how are you going to get the word out? You're only spending five minutes a day on social media. It takes you longer than that just to make a post. Well, it's not unusual for me to go three or four days without even checking my social media. I refuse to do so. 
how do you say you you're doing online work that on and, and doing it on social media? That's that's impossible. No, it's not. And that's the purpose of today's sermon. But to answer your question, I use what's called automation. I have systems now in place that allows me to make one post and it goes to six or seven different social media platforms. I also have a VA that handles you know, graphics and, and, and posts those things on social media for me. By doing this, I'm able to accomplish more now in one day than I could in four or five days before. The best part is it looks like I'm on social media, but I'm not. I have information going out, but I don't consume any of that crap coming in. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't get sucked down that rabbit hole anymore of social media gossip. Praise God. James 3 verse 6 says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. In other words, if you're spreading gossip, it's coming from the devil. Now, James is talking about the spoken word here, but in today's digital age, the same principle applies to what we type, to what we post, to what we share online. It's set on fire by the fire of hell itself, the devil. Gossip spreads like wildfire on the internet. One post that spreads a lie can quickly go viral damaging people's reputations, destroying relationships, causing division in the body of Christ. And then they find out a few days later, oh, that was a lie. Damage has already been done. Many people have said, I'm not following that person anymore, and they click off it, or, you know, the damage has been done. And that's all the devil was looking at doing. Folks, as followers of Jesus, you have to resist the temptation to engage in that crap. So, how do we res resist then, Brother Bob? How do we resist the temptation to gossip online and offline? Well, the Bible, again, gives us clear instructions on how to avoid falling into this trap. First and foremost, you need to guard your hearts and minds. Philippians 4.8 tells us, Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. In other words, we need to be intentional about what we allow our minds to consume. This means being discerning about the content we consume online. Not everything we read, watch, or listen to is beneficial. We need to focus on things that are true, noble, uplifting, rather than indulging in gossip and negativity all the time. I can't believe that person did that. I can't believe it. I was at the store and this lady did that. <clears throat> Folks, nobody cares what you have for breakfast either. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Secondly, we must use our words to build others up, not tear them down. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Do not let any, let me say that again so you understand what I'm saying, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Our words, whether spoken or typed, have the power to either build up or destroy. As Christians, we are called to use our words to encourage, to edify, and uplift others. This means avoiding gossip and slander, both in our personal conversations and online. I mean, how many times have you been at work and you say, you look around and say, don't say nothing, but, and you start spreading that. Folks, we need to mind our own business. Now, that may sound a bit blunt, but it's biblical. Praise God. Don't look at me at that, that, that tone of voice. I, I see you looking at me right now. I hear what you're saying. 
by the Spirit of God. Ah, oh, don't shut me down. I'm preaching good. Praise God. Mind your own business. That's what I'm saying. Mind your own business. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. Paul urges believers to make it your ambition and your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you to do. Gossip, folks, often comes from a desire to meddle in other people's affairs. But God calls us to focus our attention on our own lives and our own responsibilities. When we're busy doing the work God's called us to do, we are less likely to get caught up in the drama and the gossip surrounding other people's lives. The key is to keep our focus on our own journey, on our own relationship with God, and the tasks He's assigned to us. By doing this, we'll find ourselves less interested in the gossip that tempts us online or in person. Amen. You know, does it really matter you take a picture of someone you see in the store wearing pajamas and slippers in a store or something and you make a comment about, does it matter to you at all? Why would you even do that? Well, she just looks silly. It doesn't matter. Maybe, just maybe, she's really sick and she just had to get in there and get her medicine and get out. You don't know. You know, you see, uh, Lord, give me another example. I'll just, just say a politician. You see a politician using his fingers to eat tacos or something like that, and then he's licking his fingers when he's done. I'll just, I haven't seen that. I'm just saying, that's, we'll just use that as an example. You take a picture of it. Say, how disgusting. Oh, he, he has a napkin right there. Instead, he was licking his finger. How disgusting. He's such a jerk. Does it matter to you? Does it affect your life one way or another? No. Folks, we need to seek God's wisdom in these matters. Not the world's version of wisdom or knowledge. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 reminds us, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. The wisdom that comes from God is pure, peace-loving, considerate, full of mercy, James 3.17. That's a far cry from what the world calls wisdom today, which is gossip and slander. That only leads to destruction. When we seek God's wisdom, we'll be able to discern what information is beneficial for us and what will only harm our spiritual walk. Folks, finally, we need to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what's contrary to the flesh. Gossip is the work of the flesh. But when we walk in the Spirit, we're empowered to resist the temptation to engage in gossip. The Holy Spirit enables us to exercise, folks, self-control and guides us into all truth. When we're being led by the Spirit, we're able to turn away from gossip, identify it for what it is, and instead just speak words of life and encouragement. Praise God. So what kind of steps can we take to avoid gossip online? I mean, everybody's online nowadays. How are we going to avoid all this, Brother Bob? Well, now that you understand the biblical principles behind avoiding gossip... Let's talk about some practical steps that you can take to stay clear of it, especially in this online world that we're talking about. <clears throat> First, pray about every post you're going to put online. Brother Bob, 
I post lots online every day. I got to pray about Yes, you're probably one of the problems. Ouch. Don't put your toes out underneath the table. I will jump on them. Just be discerning about the content that you consume. Not every article, not every blog post, not every social media post is worthy of your time. Before you click on that sensational headline or watch that juicy video, just ask yourself, is this beneficial? Does this honor God at all? Is this information I really need? If the answer is no, just scroll past it. Don't allow your mind to be filled with negativity and slander. Next, think before you post or comment. Before you hit that share button, or type out a comment, take a moment to consider your words. Are they kind? Are they true? Will they build others up or tear them down? Remember Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. Your words have the ability to either bring life or cause harm. Even online, choose to speak life. You know, there's, there's one platform I'm on called Quora. And... You know, people ask a question, and if it's related to what I have background in, whether police work or public speaking or podcasting, things like that, and the Holy Spirit moves me, I will make a post or comment to what they asked. And then, sometimes months later, I mean, I, I get updates every day, but I don't go back and check it. But sometimes I'll have one, someone left a comment. And I say, well, let me go see what this comment says. And it's totally negative. You know, they're talking bad about cops or whatever. And there was a day, there was a point in time, several years back, where I was trying to correct their line of thinking. Let's put it like that. And then we get into this negativity discussion back and forth. And then other people are chiming in. You know, and next thing you know, I'm just fed up with it. Well, to avoid that, I very rarely comment on anything. I make my post answering that question. And if I are, am led by the Spirit, I'll look at the comment. And if it's negative and it's just being one of them jerks that you know don't like cops because of bad experience or whatever. And you know, instead of engaging in that, I just let it go. Because if you comment on it, now it refreshes in everybody's feed again. Just let it go, and within within the day, it's so far down the list, nobody even cares. They'll never notice it. But if you comment on it, it refreshes. It refreshes. It refreshes. Now it's getting on the uh, the algorithms of that platform. It's oh, we're getting we're getting tracked with. It. Let's make this available to even more people. So I learned through my studies about how social media platforms are working and all that, the algorithms, just leave it alone. It'll be dead by noon and you, nobody will ever see it again. Now, if I get a positive comment, I'll refresh that one. Yeah, sure. You know, get that viral traffic going. But that's what I mean. Think before you comment and hit share. Next, unfollow or unmute accounts that promote gossip. Social media is a breeding ground for gossip, but you don't have to participate. If you find that certain accounts or pages are constantly sharing gossip, sharing rumors, posting negative content, it's okay to unfollow them or to mute their posts. Your mental and spiritual health, folks, is more important than staying in the know about every scandal or rumor that's out there. Next, set boundaries with your online time. Oh, praise God. Remember the story about how I spent, didn't even know it, I spent four hours online posting and all this other stuff. I was just going to jump on for 10, 15 minutes. Four hours, half a day. So set boundaries. That's what I usually do. I'll say I got five minutes. I'll set, set my watch. And I go on there, I check. I'll just leave it at that. Set boundaries. 
Because the more time you spend mindlessly scrolling through social media or news sites, the more likely you are to come across some form of gossip. And then that temptation to make a comment, maybe try to put your point of view out there. Let's say someone posts something from a different faith. I'll just use this as an example. You po- you're you commenting or something about or answering a question on, you know, uh, why do you think the Bible's true or whatever, and the Holy Spirit moves you to post a comment. And you get a comment from this other faith that says, you know, the Bible is totally wrong, the Koran is right or whatever. And you start engaging back and forth, trying to point your point of view now more of his buddies are jumping on and they're attacking. And this is, Again, the elders are picking this up. They're spreading that false word throughout the world. If you just let it go, that social media post would die. If you share like, if you feel like sharing the gospel online, create your own post and start sharing that. You have to set boundaries for yourself, folks. You have to set boundaries for yourself. Limit your time on social media and make sure the time you do spend is purposeful and uplifting. When you do that, that's good. That's good. And pray for wisdom wisdom and discernment. I mean, we can't do this in our own strength. We need God's help to navigate this digital age and avoid the pitfalls of gossip. So just pray for wisdom or discernment as you engage with the online world. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in what you should read, what you should watch, what kind of videos you should watch. Ask the Holy Spirit. Do you really want to view some TikTok celebrity dancing semi-nude, chugging vodka or whatever do you is it really necessary for you to see that and watch it is it really necessary to share it so just ask the holy spirit to give you strength to resist the temptation of gossip folks the internet is a great thing oh this is a, an answer to centuries of prayer there was a point in time when if I wanted to share the gospel with, well, I'll just use Pakistan as an example. If I, if I was led by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel in Pakistan, I'd have to raise funds, take off work, take two weeks by boat to get there. I wasn't going to hold one meeting and come home. I might be there for two more months, six months, a year. And then come back home when I ran out of money. So two years, we'll say, out of our life was spent sharing the gospel. Today, and I've done this every year, I'm invited back to speak to the graduating class of a Bible study. It's not a Bible study group. It's a, a Bible college, put it like that, group in Pakistan. Every year, past four years or so, I've been invited to speak to these, this graduating class and share some wisdom about the Holy Spirit, things like that. I know it's coming. I know what date and time it is. I sit down here at the computer, log in, and here's that class. They see me, I see them, and I deliver my message. I answer questions and all that. Time's up. Log off. Go do my own stuff. Praise God for the internet. Praise That's what makes this broadcast possible. There was a point in time when if I was going to share this message with the world, well, first, let's say I could just share it locally on the radio station because we couldn't afford satellite or uh, there wasn't any satellite TV. You had to send it to the networks and all this other stuff, but I'd have to record it on a cassette tape, mail it or drive it to the radio station, drop it off, they'd play it, or mail it to all these different radio stations. Make videos, send them out to the television stations. Today, in a period of one hour, 
Not only have I delivered this message live on Evangelism Radio, I've got the recordings that are going to go next week. They'll be on all my time slots on Evangelism Radio. Social media posts are sharing it. They're on the social media platforms. They can click. You can click on it and watch it through Facebook, LinkedIn, and all that. Folks, technology is great. This remember what Jesus said: the end will only come when the gospel is shared throughout the world, and we are doing it right now right now. So the internet is good. You, you need to use the internet for good. We need to use the internet to glorify God, to help spread his love, to encourage others. And here's a few more ways we can use the internet for good. Share uplifting and encouraging content. Amen. Use your platform to share Bible verses prayers, testimonies, encouraging messages that build others up, not tear them down. Whether you're on social media, writing a blog, or just sharing with friends, be intentional about spreading positivity and hope, not negativity, not trying to tear somebody down or making them look bad. Engage in meaningful conversations. Instead of participating in gossip or negative discussions, as I shared, engage in conversations that truly matter. Ask people, hey, last week you said you're sick. How you doing? Can I pray for you? Share a word of encouragement. Use your online presence to reflect the love of Jesus in your interactions. And be a source of of truth in the world. The world is full of rumors and half-truths. Be a voice of truth. Don't participate in the spread of false information or slander. I don't care. Even if it's against a politician you just despise, you don't need to add your two cents worth to the conversation. Instead, speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. Be a beacon of light in this digital world. Not a black light, sucking all the light out of it. Be a beacon of the light of the gospel to the digital world. And utmost of, of utmost importance, if there's one thing I want to drive home, from today's message, pray before you post. Before you post anything online, just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, should I hit this send button? Is this going to lift somebody up or tear somebody down? Just ask God for wisdom and discernment. Seek his guidance in what you share. This one simple practice can help you avoid the temptation to get into a, a gospel or a, a, a gossip discussion and it'll ensure your online presence continuously reflects your faith. They're not going to see you talking about the Bible and God and all this and over here tearing somebody down because I guarantee I see it. I've experienced it, but I also see it. Or someone will say, I thought you were a Christian. Huh? Ever had those comments on your social media posts? You post something, you know, disparaging about somebody, and sure enough, you're going to see it. I thought you were a Christian. Yeah, pray before you hit that send button. Amen? You need to refrain from posting about God. You have a higher calling, folks. You have a higher calling than that. One of the greatest challenges we face today is the temptation to not only consume gossip, but to spread it through the sharing and commenting of posts that really have no real value. We live in a world where everybody has an opinion. Many feel compelled to voice that opinion on every trending topic, no matter how harmful or irrelevant that topic may even be. But as followers of Christ, we're called to a higher standard. When we see posts online that are nothing but gossip, it can be tempting to share them or jump into the comment section to add our two cents worth. 
But before you hit that share button or leave that comment, just take a step back and ask yourself, will this glorify God? Will this build others up? Or will it just contribute to the spread of rumors and negativity? Folks, we're called to be peacemakers, not quarrelers, not quarrel starters. James 1.19 reminds us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slower still to become more angry. This is especially true online where it's so easy to react with other things. Click that like, hit that share, and you're on to the next one. When we refrain from engaging at all like this with gossip and instead we just choose to remain silent, just scroll past it, we are exercising godly wisdom and showing the maturity of our faith. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This means even when we disagree with what we see or hear online, we should strive to respond in a way that promotes peace and unity, not division and strife. There was a point in time in this nation with politics, you know, the two sides, Democrat, Republican, they would oppose each other vehemently on the floor of the Senate or House. But then they'd go out to dinner afterwards and say, look, is there any way we can compromise on this here? And over dinner, they'd work it all out. Next day, they go back and hit it, their amendments, and boom, it's all done. And, and the, the United States was better for it. Now, they won't even talk to each other in the hallway, praise God, let alone have dinner with each other. Gossip, whether spoken or shared through a post or comment, only stirs up the conflict. By refraining from posting on gossip, we protect ourselves and others from the harm gossip causes. Folks, let's get ready to wrap this up. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve's desire for knowledge outside of God's will led to their downfall. Today, we face similar temptations in the digital age where the internet offers us access to vast amounts of information, much of which is not for our benefit. Gossip in particular is a destructive force that can damage relationships, create division, and distract us from our true purpose as followers of Christ. As Christians, we are called to resist the temptation of gossip and instead to use our words and our actions to build others up. By guarding our hearts and our minds, seeking God's wisdom and walking in the Spirit, we can navigate this internet in a way that honors God and reflects His love to the entire world. The tree of knowledge may be present in our digital lives, but we, we have the power through Christ to choose life, truth, and love over the temptation of tasting that forbidden fruit of gossip. Additionally, it's crucial to recognize the very role we play in the spread of gossip online. Before posting, commenting, or sharing anything on social media, we have to ask ourselves, is this uplifting? Does this promote the unity of Christ, or is it going to create a division? Proverbs 18 reminds us, 1821, the tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. The same is true of our online words and actions as well. We must refrain from spreading gossip and negativity, even in the form of sharing posts or commenting on threads that tear others down or spread rumors. Instead of contributing to the culture of gossip, gossip we should be a light in this digital world by promoting truth, love, and kindness. Kindness. Let our online presence reflect the heart of Christ. Choosing to speak words that build up and not tear down. By resisting the urge to engage in gossip, we protect ourselves and others from the destructive consequences gossip brings. And we stay aligned with God's will in both our real life and our digital lives. I, I, I pray that you've received this message today in the spirit in which I've delivered it. Not to condemn you for your online use, but to inform you, to build you up in your most holy calling, which is to share the gospel. If this message today has brought about a few ouch moments, he's speaking to me moments, it's not Pastor Bob. 
No. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit urging you, as Haggai 1 5 says, to consider your ways. Consider your ways in your online presence. Consider your ways in social media posts. Consider your ways in spreading gossip instead of the gospel. Just repent. If what I described is how you've been operating online, repent. That's all you got to do. Jesus is quick and just to forgive. Then just ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in all of your online activities. Amen? If you've never asked Jesus to become the Lord of your life, folks, there is no better time than right now. Praise God. Just pray this prayer with me. Say these words again out loud, at least loud enough for your own two ears to hear your own voice. Say these words. Just repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know I've messed up. I've done things online that I should not have participated in. I've shared gossip. I didn't know if things were true or not. It didn't affect me one way or another, so I know I sinned in this area. I know I did. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your grace, your mercy even extends to the online world. Forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins, including gossip. Forgive me, Jesus, of any negativity I've shared online. Forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me clean. Oh, Lord, come into my heart. Create in me this new man, one that loves you, one that loves the word of God and one that will share this love with the world from this point forward with my social media posts. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord, for this new life you've now created in me. And Father, I give you all honor, all glory, all praise, and all things at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with me, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. Praise the Lord. I, I want to rejoice with you. If you prayed that prayer, hey, make a social media post out of it. Praise God. Let everyone know, hey, I'm a Christian. Praise God. You want to start some gossip? Hallelujah. That's the best way of doing it. All these people that have been following all this negativity, and all of a sudden you say, I prayed the forgiveness of all the gossip I spread, all the rumors I spread, and today I changed my life. I became a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ now, not a follower of whatever junks on social media. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, it's been good today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Hallelujah. I can get up run around this room 35 times shouting hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I might just do that because that's all the time we have for today. This pastor by reminding you, be blessed in all that you do.